Welcome. Um, it's my real pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, this session of the uh, immense uh, Grassley uh, Festival of Research on Sustainable Finance. Uh, this year it's been a fantastic uh, set of uh, presentations and insights we've had so far. Uh, today um, we'll be looking at uh, the issues of central banks and how they can uh, connect the work they're doing in terms of responding to the COVID crisis with the actions around uh, climate and climate risk. My name is uh, Nick Robbins. I'm a professor in practice at uh, the London School of Economics, and I'm a co-author with uh, Simon Dickow and Uli Voltz uh, of a, a toolbox of sustainable crisis response measures. This was produced by uh, the LS LSE, where Simon and I uh, are based, and also the SOAS uh, Centre for Sustainable Finance, which uh, Lee Voltz uh, leads. This was produced uh, through the INSPIRE uh, programme, uh, which is the International Network for Sustainable Finance Policy Insights Research and Exchange. Um, and I'm delighted to be the co-chair of that initiative. Um, we're really pleased that INSPIRE is one of the two research stakeholders of the Network for Greening the Financial System, uh, the, the network that involves now over 60 uh, central banks and financial supervisors around the world. And the other uh, research, stakeholder is, uh, research stakeholder is, of course, uh, Grassfee uh, itself. So uh, for today, we have uh, a, a great uh, panel uh, in front of you. I will be moderating the session. We'll kick off with a presentation of the, the toolbox, the key findings. Uh, first, uh, Uli uh, Voltz will, will kick off, followed by uh, Simon. And then delighted to have two really um, uh, insightful uh, respondents there. First, we'll have uh, Chris Faint, uh, who is head of division and uh, head of the uh, Bank of England's climate a hub uh, uh, um, and uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to us with us today um, and uh, Chris uh, very looking forward very much looking forward to your, your comments and and after Chris has given his his feedback and, and insights we will have uh, uh, Adele Morris who is the Joseph Peckman senior fellow uh, and economic studies uh, policy director uh, looking at climate change and energy uh, at the Brookings Institute in Washington DC um, Adele is leading actually an Inspire project on uh, the Federal Reserve and climate risk, but probably now, uh, very importantly, is also one of the contributors to the recent uh, Commodity Futures and Trading Commission report on climate risk, which I believe came out yesterday uh, and is really sort of hot off the press. So I'm sure we'll get some really um, up, to, up to the moment insights on the contents of that and then the implications uh, for, for, for regulation. So uh, in terms of that's that's the sort of the formal process, then obviously there will be opportunities for Q&A. Uh, please do use the Q&A function and I'll try to uh, pose those to the um, uh, to, to the to the panelists, um, either name them to, to, to individuals or, or as a general question. Uh, there's also a chat function and obviously use that for sharing uh, documents um, that you would like to share um, uh, with, with other participants. Um, and, and so I think with that, I'm going to now turn over to the content of the session. Um, Uli, um, first, Simon, do you want to sort of get, get the screens uh, up and running? And then, Uli, do you want to kick off in terms of uh, going through the toolbox and pulling out the rationale and the key findings? Thank you. Thank you, Nick, and uh, great pleasure to, to be here in this discussion with um, everyone. So uh, let me briefly introduce the uh, uh, toolbox. Um, central banks have been playing a crucial role uh, during this crisis, initially in stabilizing financial markets when, when uh, they were close to implosion uh, in March. Uh, they've been also uh, keeping the economy afloat and uh, central banks and supervisors also uh, will have to play a crucial role in the recovery phase once we get there. And it's important to highlight that even though uh, the responses right now are very much geared towards the short term, the actions taken now in many cases will have very profound implications also on long term outcomes. And so even though um, the dominating discussions, uh, arguably central banks really uh, and supervisors need to uh, consider how their actions are affecting uh, sustainability outcomes, um, including uh, climate change. Um, 
In the toolbox, we put forward uh, four reasons why central banks and supervisors should be concerned uh, with climate change and other sustainability challenges at this time. So, first of all, central banks uh, themselves uh, may be exposed to material climate related risks. Uh, the NGFS has uh, put forward an impressive amount of work um, highlighting the materiality of climate related financial risks. And uh, so, if central banks are, for example, conducting asset purchase programs, uh, they would also uh, uh, should also account for climate risk in their own operations. I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, secondly, central banks and supervisors clearly um, have a role to play in minimizing uh, risk for individual financial institutions uh, and the financial system at large. And um, as I'll explain in a moment, uh, there are uh, the current actions uh, can actually uh, uh, lead to a buildup of uh, climate and sustainability risks, if not properly uh, taken into account. And then lastly, um, central banks and supervisors as public bodies arguably have an important uh, role to play uh, in uh, facilitating sustainable investment in line with the Paris Agreement, as well as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. can move on to the next slide, please. So the slide is not moving for some reason or another, but here it is. So uh, we argue that uh, there is a risk that at the moment we see a lot of liquidity enhancing stimulus measures that are not aligned with sustainability objectives. And this could contribute to a significant buildup of risk uh, in financial portfolios. Um, and so uh, be a risk to financial stability of individual institutions, but also of the financial system uh, at large. And importantly, uh, it can also um, kind of these liquidity enhancing measures can contribute to a lock in of climate risk. Uh, that will uh, hamper the um, the just transition that we desperately need. Importantly, uh, central banks and supervisors have been easing various countercyclical and prudential instruments, and that this is absolutely uh, the right thing to do in in a crisis like this. Um, but there is a risk that if these are um, eased in a non-sustainable, risk-sensitive way. Uh, they may enhance uh, certain risks. Um, so uh, we would argue that it's absolutely crucial uh, that central banks and supervisors um, push on with the sustainability agenda so that uh, climate risks and other sustainability risks are addressed head on, even during this crisis, and, and that the uh, agenda that the NGFS uh, has put forward is not being delayed. Uh, but rather that um, uh, central banks and supervisors really uh, re-emphasize the need uh, for moving ahead with this agenda. And if you could move on to the next slide, please. The good news is that there are quite a lot of uh, monetary and prudential instruments that can be calibrated in a way that accounts for climate or other sustainability related financial risks, or that will contribute to uh, a scaling up of uh, sustainable finance. And I'll just mention a few points, which I think uh, are very relevant, but Simon will in a moment uh, move on to, to uh, present uh, the larger toolbox. So first, um, uh, um, uh, instrument that uh, central banks in particular um, uh, should Take, uh, should be taking a look, to, look at is um, collateral frameworks. Uh, these can be amended to account for climate uh, and other sustainability related risks. And, and these are very powerful tools um, and help to, to reduce uh, the exposure uh, of the financial sector to uh, certain types of risks. Um, 
when conducting asset purchase programs, and a lot of central banks even now in emerging economies are doing that, um, these asset purchases should also take account um, of climate risk uh, in line with the Paris and sustainability goals. And um, this does not mean that we're calling for green quantitative easing, which most central bankers uh, um, uh, are very much not inclined to do, uh, but it's about not purchasing uh, certain non-sustainable uh, assets. So it's not kind of uh, green QE, it's, it's kind of non-dirty QE. Um, thirdly, um, when uh, adjusting prudential measures uh, during um, kind of uh, to, to, to uh, enhance liquidity and so on, um, these uh, transition risks and physical uh, risks of climate change need to be taken into account. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, central banks um, uh, should also um, uh, take responsible investment principles into account when managing their own portfolios. And uh, central banks can really, and supervisors can send uh, kind of uh, strong signals uh, to the institutions they supervise uh, that they really uh, have to uh, take these risks into account. And that doesn't mean that they have to Im implement all kinds of regulatory burdens uh, right now, uh, but uh, they can uh, send strong signals uh, that risks need to be taken on board. And I hand over to Simon. Yes. Um, thank you, Uli. So I will, I will quickly run you through, through the toolbox itself. So, so the toolbox is, um, is informed by global experience, and we are very aware that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. And our toolbox, therefore, uh, reflects different financial cultures, policy spaces, and objectives of central banks and supervisors well, around the world. So, yes, there are, there are two important aspects here. So, first, instruments that are seen as standard by some central banks may not be used, uh, may not be conventionally used elsewhere. And then secondly, central banks and supervisors across different jurisdictions operate, of course, within very different mandates and legal frameworks. So the toolbox itself has uh, three overall areas, monetary policy, prudential policy, and other. And then we have nine policy subcategories. And for each of the different instruments, we point out how a conventional sustainability blind calibration looks like <clears throat> and how these instruments could be employed with a sustainability enhanced calibration. So the first category that we see here is monetary policy. Here we have four, four instruments, um, collateral frameworks, indirect monetary policy instruments, such as open market operations or reserve requirements, direct monetary policy instruments, uh, some of which can of course be used to affect the allocation of credit, and, um, and, um, oh, oh, and non-standard instruments, of course, including asset purchase programs and helicopter money. So for most of these instruments, there are specific proposals for, for how they could be aligned with, uh, with sustainability goals. But for others, for example, for collateral frameworks, um, these are still being worked out at the moment. The second category is prudential policy. Um, here we have uh, microprudential instruments, including stress testing, disclosure, and other Basel III instruments. And um, yes, yeah, so, so with regard to a, to a sustainability enhanced calibration, climate risk related stress tests, mandatory ESG disclosure, and uh, for example, a climate risk sensitive calibration of, of differential uh, risk-based capital requirements would be, would be options here. Then we also have micro, uh, um, macro prudential instruments. Here we differentiate between cyclical instruments and, and cross-sectional um, cross instruments. The third category um, includes other policies. First of all, uh, further financing schemes and other initiatives, for example, corporate financing facilities or loan guarantees and, and well, also financial sector bailouts. And we argue that these could be made conditional on the reduction of CO2 emissions or the focus on, on sustainability enhanced activities. Then, as Uli mentioned, there, there's the management of central bank portfolios where, where disclosure of uh, climate related financial risks could be an important first step. And finally, there are, there are, um, there's the support for sustainable finance activities, which should be rolled out and not be delayed despite the current crisis.
So to, to contextualize this, this toolbox and to, and to also to test our classification empirically, um, we looked at all currently used crisis response measures by, by central banks and, and supervisors around the world. And this investigation uh, was based on the IMF's policy response to COVID-19 tracker. So we looked, we looked at policies, um, uh, at the policies of around 200 central banks and monetary unions. And an interesting finding is that most, if not all of these instruments that we propose in our toolbox are currently used, however, in a non-sustainability enhancing way. And um, yes, more specifically with regard to the different instruments, we find that on monetary policy, a lot of central banks have moved very quickly to extend their collateral frameworks and to include a broader variety and quality of assets. And on supervision, what we see across the board is that, that many central banks and supervisors have eased counter cyclical capital buffers and general microprudential regulation and, well, and, and supervisory standards. So yes, with a few exceptions, we have not been able to identify any monetary or prudential crisis response instrument that, that uh, instruments that have been calibrated um, in order to, to enhance sustainability. However, there are some positive um, examples and exceptions where authorities are advancing um, their sustainability agenda despite of COVID-19. Um, ongoing efforts in China, for example, or the, the, the efforts by the, by the NGFS. The NGFS has published a lot of reports over the last months um, on, on, on stress testing and monetary policy. So there are considerable efforts there. And, on, and, and quite a few central banks have also launched um, sustainable finance initiatives, for example, Mexico, the Philippines, and two days ago also um, the Brazilian central bank. Okay, so conclusions and ways forward. There, there are two interesting initial conclusions that, that we have. First, um, many changes have not been fully implemented yet, and the dynamic nature therefore provides considerable scope for central banks and supervisors to, to retrofit uh, some sustainability factors in, into their crisis response measures. And then secondly, um, well, this policy response also demonstrates that a broad set of instruments is, is actually available to central banks. And we would argue that to some degree, this renders the ongoing debate redundant regarding the availability of a number of these unconventional me um, measures because, well, because some of them have now been used uh, by central banks and in the past it has been argued that these could not be used. Um, yes, also interesting that quite a few of these of these unconventional instruments have now been used um, and have been calibrated to, uh, to support specific sectors. In most cases, the SME sector or the tourism sector. And yes, to, to conclude, we, we think that this bears the question of whether this creates now some policy space and an opportunity um, to green central banking and to, and to scale up green finance and to further include climate risks in, in binding regulation. Yes, thank you. And back to Nick. Excellent, Uli uh, and Simon, thank, thanks so much for that. I think what has been very interesting in this process of putting the toolbox together has been both the sort of cataloging of the, the policy instruments and then the empirical work to look actually across uh, the range of interventions that central banks have done uh, during uh, the, the crisis. Uh, and one of the things we've, we've been very, very conscious of is the very clear signaling that central banks, individual central banks, um, uh, alliances such as the NHS has been giving about the importance of a green and sustainable recovery as we move out of uh, this this crisis. So I think we've seen actually uh, some really interesting examples of a sort of increasing um, commitment. Um, I've sent uh, in the chat uh, the link to the toolbox itself, obviously, uh, if you want to look at now or, or later on, and maybe that'll give you some more thoughts about the questions you might want to ask the, the panelists uh, when we come to that. But first, Really good to pass on to uh, a central banker, to, to Chris uh, Faint, as I said, who leads uh, the Bank of England's uh, climate hub. Obviously, the Bank of England really want one of the, the central banks at the, at, the, at the vanguard of these efforts. Um, and uh, Chris, really interested to hear uh, your views on the toolbox, obviously, and also how um, 
you in this in in, in the Bank of England have been uh, navigating the issue of of climate change and climate risk in these these very tough months we've had and and, and where it might go in the future. So so Chris, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for the uh, invite to speak today. And I wanted to start by congratulating you and the team on getting the Inspire report out so quickly during the crisis. No mean feat, given all of the challenges that it uh, represented. Um, and, this, and this is really important work to be done, not only as a check for central banks, but also as a way of us uh, looking at actions together in a holistic way, because I think so often uh, actions are just looked at on a, on a, on a piecemeal basis. And it's, of course, um, right at the top of the bank's agenda. As Andrew Bailey set out in June, the bank is fully supportive of a green recovery from the pandemic, as it is critical to ensuring an orderly transition to net zero is achieved by 2050. And this is central to our objectives, as it reduces the risks faced by, by the UK financial system and the economy in a way that will become more and more important over time. Just to just to bring that a little bit to life, uh, a recent study in Nature found that the green recovery measures could reduce future warming by 0.3 degrees. And investment in the green recovery could also help support the labour market during the recovery process. For example, with the IEA Sustainable Recovery Report found that green recovery measures could save or create 9 million jobs globally over the next three years. But let me quickly just set out what I see as the bank's role in the green recovery. The, the, the exact size and shape of the green recovery packages, particularly on the fiscal side, is a matter for government to determine in the first part. And we've started to see some measures come through, for example, in their scheme for home improvement grants. However, a green recovery is not possible without the financial sector. And financial sector firms can scale up their own efforts to support the transition. And in doing so, what they can do is maximise the impact of green recovery packages. Similarly, by improving their own management of climate related financial risks, they can have a cascading effect to their clients in the real economy, helping them transition as well. So in this way, building back better and a green recovery needs to have the private sector as well as governments and as well as central banks given the scale of the climate challenge that we face. And, and that's where the bank comes in. The, the, the bank can play its part here by ensuring that the financial sector is in a position to do this effectively. And this has been a major area of focus for us for, for some time. So for example, we, uh, we've issued a supervisory statement to all of our regulatory fir regulated firms setting out how they should address climate risks. Uh, we are working internationally um, to advance understanding of climate risks through, uh, through the NGFS, for example. We are also working to advance climate disclosures, both internationally and domestically. And this is really key to getting an understanding of climate risks embedded in the market. And we'll be undertaking a climate stress test next year on the UK system. And I think, I think this in particular is important because it will force large banks and insurers to have more detailed conversations with their key clients about what transition plans they have in place, speaking directly to uh, the green transition. But there's also, of course, the actions that the bank has taken as a direct response to the crisis. Uh, we've announced a number of schemes to provide liquidity into firms and the economy. Um, and this immediate response to the pandemic has taken a number of different forms. If I just summarize some of them, um, we've released counter-cyclical capital requirements on firms to allow them to lend into the economy at a time that it is most needed. And picking up my previous point from before, our, our expectation is that firms will increasingly take into account climate considerations when they are doing this lending. And in fact, um, we've just said to firms that we, our expectation is that would have, they would have fully embedded that by the end of 2021. Um, the bank also took deliberately broad-based measures at some scale and speed to provide, uh, to protect livelihoods and stabilise the economy and the financial system. So this included the launching of the short-term CCFF funding, extra quantitative easing and rate cuts. Not only were these actions essential, um, it should also be noted that the stability that it contributed has helped form the foundation upon which a green recovery can be built in the next phase uh, 
of the economic response to the pandemic, um, where structural considerations like climate change can and should play a bigger, bigger role. But as flagged by the Inspire report, it is absolutely right that the bank, as well as other central banks, should be looking at the actions that it's taking and considering whether they should be iterated in the future to reflect climate considerations further. And there's there's a number of actions that we are taking in this in this regard. Uh, firstly, as as noted by Andrew Bailey earlier this year, we are we are looking at our asset purchase scheme and we'll explore with HMT under whose mandate we operate ways that climate risks could be further incorporated. We are we're also interrogating our own climate exposures, as you cannot determine where change is needed if you do not understand the current position. So in, in line with this, we have just published our first um, ever TCFD report on the bank's climate exposures. Um, and I think, I think this is the first time um, such a broad TCFD report has been published for a central bank. Um, and we're continuing our work domestically and internationally uh, and with the COP unit to build up broader capabilities in, uh, in markets to help understand climate risks. For example, through the development of portfolio warming metrics. And, uh, and I think this brings me quite neatly to the Inspire toolbox. As I mentioned before, th this tool toolbox is particularly useful as it brings together a large number of potential measures in one place under its four priority areas for central banks to focus on. Be beyond the observation that this looks like a pretty comprehensive list, I certainly couldn't think of anything that wasn't on it. I had two key takeaways. The, the first, um, is that all of the ingredients in the toolkit are really important considerations that I would argue actually transcend uh, the COVID crisis. By, by this, what I mean is that many of the actions set out represent those that should be taken by central banks through the economic cycle rather than just at the point of crisis. And for, for that reason, I think you'll see that many of the actions listed being undertaken by central banks prior to the crisis um, uh, were, sorry, were being undertaken by central banks prior to the crisis rather than at the point of crisis. But that said, of, of course, central banks come in many different forms and some have engaged with climate to different degrees. So the advancement uh, of the toolkit will differ by region and I doubt um, if any central bank is doing everything on the list. I know that the Bank of England is not at the moment. I, I can therefore see huge value um, in evolving these toolkits in a way that allows them to be used as a reference point for central banks at all times. Um, my second observation is on momentum of actions. Um, it's just an unfortunate reality that during times of stress, capabilities of institutions get squeezed as they have to focus on the crisis in hand. And this can have an impact on the investment in areas such as climate, but as we know, uh, climate change is not going away, so we cannot afford to delay our actions. So with this in mind, um, the, the bank um, has sought to strike the right balance uh, here between being pragmatic and focusing our efforts on getting the most bang for our buck from um, our resources. Um, and in our case, one of the things that we've been focusing on is continuing, continuing to work with the private sector to advance climate analysis. Um, so the key, the key um, changes that I would observe is that you know, with our climate stress test, we did have to push it back a little bit just because the stress test relied upon um, financial firms having discussions with the real economy firms. And we just thought the, uh, the timing of the crisis would not lead to the most productive discussions. So we have said, look, we'll just push it back to and, and maintain the scope. However, at the same time, we have put firms on notice that this time should be used to embed climate risks throughout their businesses. And we should and we have heavily invested in areas such as scenario development, both through the NGFS and domestically. So, so whilst the Inspire report focuses on the actions that central banks have taken in response to a crisis, I believe that it can also be used to consider where existing actions have been delayed or curtailed as a response. Um, which is really important as we go through this period. Now, I've, uh, I've been speaking for a while, so I'll, I'll stop there, but let me just finish by reiterating how important it is that we all work together to secure the green recovery
Um, we all have a role to play in this, and it is essential that we continue to challenge ourselves on whether we are taking all of the actions that we can. Reports such as that compiled by Spire are a hugely valuable tool that can help us to do this. Thank you very much. Chris, that was really, really good, and, I, and it was really good from the, uh, the burning deck, as it were, of how, how to manage uh, uh, climate risk and take things forward and, and ensure that the, the financial system is not taking its eye off the ball. Really, really interesting. I've got lots of questions I'm sure other participants have. And Adele, uh, going across the water uh, to DC, uh, great to have you. Looking forward to your comments on the toolbox and indeed some of the real um, highlights and maybe some of the sort of inside the belt beltway comments on the CFTC report, which you had a hand in. Um, so over to you, Adele. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. And I wanted to thank uh, all the previous speakers for for their uh, insightful remarks. I'll try to add of the United States in, in this discussion. So um, what Nick was just alluding to is a new report. It just came out yesterday. The, the entity that's issuing this report is a, okay, so that we have the, we have a complex set a system of financial market regulation. So one of those agencies, independent agencies, called the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And there's an advisory committee to that uh, CFTC agency called the Market Risk Advisory Committee. And they made a climate-related market risk advisory committee subcommittee. So this report is coming out from an advisory group to the CFTC. Now, this is an important distinction. So the, it, it, this report is authored by a collection of folks from banks and industry and academics such as myself, I was on this committee, and, and other experts. Um, and we wrote this report ourselves. It's not a product of government employees. It's a product of this advisory committee. But I think what, what's exciting about it first of all, is that they even created this subcommittee in the first place. And the second exciting thing is this list of recommendations that might actually look kind of familiar to those who've um, read the toolbox and some of the other recommendations of, of the TCFD and the, and the uh, uh, and, uh, Network for Greening the Financial System. So let me tell you a little bit about what the report concluded. First of all, and number one, okay, and I'm gonna read it because I think the text is really important. This is our first recommendation. The United States should establish a price on carbon. It must be fair, economy-wide, and effective in reducing emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement. This is the single most important step to manage climate risk and drive the appropriate allocation of capital. Okay, so what this is saying is the best way, the first most important way to manage the risk of climate change is to do something about it and make sure that market forces, the profit motive, um, all decisions in, within the economy are um, informed by price signals that include um, charges for carbon pollution and other greenhouse gases as appropriate. So until until you've done that, you know, you, you can have the best Federal Reserve policy to the stars, but you haven't addressed the underlying systemic risk of unaddressed climate change. Okay, so then some of the other recommendations are going to sound really familiar. First of all, the recommendation is for the United States to join the uh, NGFS. And, you know, we, we've we had parts of our government go to these meetings, but we need to be a full-throated member of the NGFS. And that's the conclusion of our subcommittee. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it's not just the Fed, to be clear, it's all these other agencies. So we've got, as I mentioned, the CFTC, we've got the um, Securities and Exchange Commission, Comptroller of the currency and other parts of the Treasury departments. And you know, there's there's about a dozen of these things, and you can see who they are if you look at our Financial Stability Oversight Council. And there are a bunch of different agencies involved in that. And so one of the key things we need to do is coordinate our climate 
related risk um, policies across these different agencies. Uh, we don't need, you know, it's not helpful to have piecemeal um, consideration when some of the same issues are going to come up for, for different agencies. Um, we're also calling for a, a vigorous research agenda um, from the research arms. And I think our um, technical experts could be quite helpful in the international conversations within the TCFD and the, and the NGFS. And I think we're gonna have to develop stress testing scenarios and procedures. All the things that you guys have been talking about, both in the toolbox and um, elsewhere, we're gonna have to start thinking about. Um, with regard to the pandemic and asset purchases and that sort of thing, I don't think we're going to be organized enough during this, you know, crisis to, um, you know, really engage on climate uh, with regard to the the current crisis. I mean, it just hasn't been part of the of the methodologies of the work stream of the research within these organizations. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about how our pandemic response relates to climate change or what the climate considerations are. It's just, I don't think our, um, we're not as far along as, uh, as other countries in, in incorporating climate related factors into the responsibilities of these agencies. Um, and, you know, I think there are a number of things that are going to be important, not just in a, in a crisis situation, but just as Chris said, and I think Chris nailed a lot of the important points for central banks, is you know what's going to, you know what's going to be pertinent inside or outside uh, a, a crisis, and that includes for the United States, it's going to include things like disclosure. Um, for example, uh, right now, companies have to report material risks, but there's really no guidance on climate related risks within that. What's material? What's the time frame over which these risks need to be considered? Um, in fact, there's some discussion about how maybe, uh, like I'll give you an example. Our, our Department of Labor recently issued a proposed rule suggesting that maybe pension fund managers should not consider uh, ESG factors in their choice of portfolios um, with the proviso that they might not be, you know, actual financial considerations. And that's the kind of thing I think we just got to get past all that and, and uh, you know, try to catch up with you guys across the pond. Um, I want to say, though, there might be some things that don't translate particularly well to the United States. And I'm just going to give you my opinion. Um, and, you know, you can take it for what it's worth, but I think there are certain sensitivities within our government that are going to be hard for any independent agency to overcome. I mean, one of them in particular is the fact that half of our legislature is opposed to any considerations of climate. And so how, how is the Fed going to take on climate in a way that doesn't provoke, uh, opposition from our Congress. So so right now, in some instances, like the CFTC, there's five commissioners and and they have staggered five-year terms and only three, up to three, can be from the same political party. That actually gives some balance to the CFTC uh, leadership. And that's partly why they were able to commission this subcommittee report um, when other oversight agencies may not have been able to do that. With the Fed, I think if we start, you know, dividing assets into clean and dirty or green and not green, I think it's 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 asking the Fed to ask for trouble politically because for every dirty industry, there's a legislator who comes from that um, district who's going to take offense at their constituents being referred to as dirty. And then I can imagine, you know, the Fed chair being hauled up to testify at Congress. And 
you know, and face questions about why did you call my constituent dirty? Like, this is not a battle the Fed really is going to win, and it's not going to be one that serves uh, the the planet. So I'm, I tend to be a little bit more reserved about th that kind of classification than maybe some other people. Um, now, I know we got a great team of people here on this panel, so I'm going to close there. Um, but I look forward to the questions and um, happy to discuss anything further. So it's very open views, and I think um, giving the the insights um, from the CFTC uh, report, which I think actually is, is is a real example of the value on of sort of robust evidence based um, uh, analysis from regulators within their mandates uh, and acting in the interests of, of, of financial stability. So a really, really, really good uh, example. We have uh, a, a, n a number of questions, um, which uh, we're gonna ask to, to the panelists and Simon, um, you can come back on as well. Brilliant, we have, have everyone. So Chris, if I can pose one straight to you is, Actually, to what extent within your team at the Climate Hub do you have, as well as the, sort of the, the, the classic sort of um, prudential and, mon and sort of financial stability and maybe monetary uh, skills, do you have people actually with um, insights from climate science and, 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 and natural sciences as well in terms of the inter interdisciplinary mix? So I'll just kick off that one. Yeah, we, we yeah, we, we, we. So the the way that they the way that they operate the operate now can can you hear me or are you getting feedback? Oh uh, yeah. Let's try this. So you so see the way the, the way that the bank operates is that it's got a climate hub and then it's got spokes across the bank and there are um, a a number of experts to different degrees around the bank. So to 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 give an example. Um, we draw upon the expert, the expertise of uh, catastrophe modelers that sit within our insurance area and work with actuaries who've got a lot of experience of working on physical risk um, and how those physical risks change over time. Um, we've got a lot of economists, as you can imagine, who um, can help us to look at how climate scenarios would, uh, would be built up. Um, so, so we do have expertise um, in the Bank of England, but but what is what is becoming very very clear is that um, not just for the Bank of England, but for institutions, we, like, we we're all looking at the same thing. We're all grappling with the same issues at the same time, and people with very very deep um, understanding of of climate issues are quite rare, and they're incredibly in in demand. Um, we we've run the uh, we've chaired the work stream within the ngfs that's been looking at climate scenarios um and um, there's a publication on this just in a, a couple of months ago um that um hopefully people um will find useful and and for that we we used a number of institutes and a number of preeminent climate scientists um to to draw analysis together and it and it really shows just how complicated this stuff is just how many models there are for looking at climate and frankly um how no single experts have a monopoly on um on on um understanding what climate outcomes could look like so so um yeah so so to to, to tie that up we we have expertise within the bank but we are a huge um uh user of expertise outside the bank um and i don't think um the climate uh the climate problem can be solved unless we all work together and share our expertise because everyone has one small part of the big puzzle. Great, Chris. Thank you for that. Um, and I think the, the scenarios really show how we need to sort of dock these two often very different worlds of learning. I mean, the, the physical sciences and so on, and then obviously uh, macroeconomic modeling and stress testing, two hitherto quite different worlds. So, so thanks for that. Then I think the question for all the panelists, this is something that has come up, I think it's coming up more frequently, certainly came up at the Inspire Festival last week. Uh, a question from Moritz Baer. Um, really do we need to um, move away from or re rethink uh, the concept of market neutrality for central banks uh, in order to contribute significantly to the low carbon transition? Um, I'm going to turn to um, Simon Ali first and then come back to you Adele and Chris. Well, uh 
Yeah, I think that, that that is really one of one of the key questions that that needs to be addressed. And um, so, my take on climate neutrality um, that whatever central banks do, it's never going to be neutral. So every almost every policy that central banks take will have uh, uh, impl kind of distributional implications. So if, even if you just take simple interest rate policy, if you raise interest rates or lower interest rates, you know, some people will benefit, others will lose out. Exchange rate policy, you know, kind of exchange rate goes up, exchange rate goes down, some will benefit, others not. So um, the, this uh, notion that central bank policy is kind of neutral, market neutral, is, is I think, a fallacy. Um, now, with respect to climate change, um, I always like to, to bring up uh, Lord Stern, who famously said that uh, climate change is the greatest market failure ever. And I think he is very right. So there are huge externalities that are not being priced in by the market. And if and, and, and financial markets, importantly, also are not sufficiently pricing in these risks. I mean, they're waking up now. And um, if central banks pretend that, you know, kind of uh, the markets are efficient and already pricing in these risks and, and, and uh, then they are perpetuating uh, the, the imbalance we're having right now. So I, I think um, uh, this notion of neutrality and that central banks can, can just kind of ignore um, uh, uh, negative externalities in the operations, uh, I, don't, I don't think this is the right way forward. But I'll stop here. I could go on for an uh, you could actually, but um, we we wouldn't be listening to you because the session would have finished. Um, uh, so, so Simon, maybe you could uh, just briefly uh, add to Uli, Uli's uh, wonderful insights, and then um, Adele and Chris, I'll come to you. Thanks. Over to you, Simon. Thanks. Yes, yes, and 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 thank you, Moritz, for for bringing up this question. Um, it is it is the big discussion right now how how this market neutrality principle can be translated into into policy in, in, in this in this environment of climate change and climate change related risks. My understanding is that this is that that it's not just uh, from the academic side that we are having this debate that but that also central banks are concerned with this. And I think uh, Christine Lagarde was was asked this question at least by by an MEP and then I think also more recently again. And so so yes, there this is being debated at least at least at the at the ECB. The question is, of course, how this translates into into policy, and whether it really calls for for this kind of um, or this specific calibration of asset purchase programs, which is which um, which is problematic if it leads to a to a carbon bias. I mean, in the context of the ECB, this is this is also interesting because the ECB is also tasked to support the uh, the, the the policy objectives of the of the European Union. And if if this if this if, if if these policy objectives include now reaching climate neutrality by 2050, it will be to see whether whether calibrating monetary policy based on the market neutrality principle can can stand in conflict with this with the second objective of reaching climate neutrality. I think I leave it at this. Thank you. Yeah, so we need a we need a synthesis, some new neutrality coming out. Potentially, yeah. Adele, how does this 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 concept of market states? Do, I mean, obviously, it's, it's sort of it's a broadly adopted uh, approach. Where where do you think it um, links with this debate on climate risk? Well, I think it. First of all, I think we should all keep our eye on the ball. The it's 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 a bank shot to emissions reductions through central bank policy in the United States because we don't have a climate policy. We don't have a single regulation that directly curbs greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, the first best and most important thing in terms of emissions mitigation is to impose some sort of regulatory program, ideally market-based, you know, adopt a, a reasonable um, an increasing carbon tax or cap and trade program, pick your, pick your tool. And there's no way that the, anything the Fed or other financial market regulators can do that is a substitute for that. We have to have a climate policy. And ideally, it should be under new legislation because under the Trump administration, we've seen the vulnerability 
of a regulatory program that's you know pretty much at the administration's discretion he just unraveled it in very short order and so we need new legislation and it needs to curtail emissions efficiently and ambitiously so i want to i want to start there i think a lot of the focus on the fed and other financial market regulators derives from frustration that our government hasn't done all that stuff so people are looking to other powerful um organizations to you know to you know pressure the economy in a particular direction i'm not saying that central bank policy isn't extremely important it's just not a substitute for the government doing its job so okay now let's let's just say okay suppose we did have a proper climate policy then what is left in terms of um, fixing market failures or achieving particular distributional outcomes that the Fed should be focused on or the other financial market regulators should be focused on. And then there, I think your toolbox lays out a bunch of really important things. For example, disclosure and making sure that markets know what the climate related risks are facing different companies. And don't forget the munip municipal bond market either. I just wrote a paper um, that's coming out soon. There's an MBER working paper version of it called Revenue at Risk at, in Coal Reliant Communities. And that looks at the devastating effect a climate policy can have on the fiscal conditions of coal reliant areas in the United States. And that's the kind of disclosure when, when these municipalities are issuing bonds, the official statements should be held to account. And the ratings agency should be held to account to incorporate and and monetize those climate related risks okay so that's an example where disclosure and all the enforcement apparatus around it is critical to getting marked so the first best get the markets to reflect all these risks and there's less concern about whether the you know any one agency is market neutral or not because the markets will be reflecting all this stuff. I'm not saying it's there's not work left over to be done, but you know, I think the bulk of it is it should be getting the markets right. And one quick fire response uh, a question in um your your sense of prospects for the Fed uh, introducing some form of climate stress test, as other central banks are doing, maybe using the NGFS scenarios and so on. What's your views on that on time frame uh, in terms of years? Well, I think I think the first thing we're going to see, um, and this might depend on the outcome of our election and other factors that are influencing where winds are going, um, we're going to see the U.S. join the NGFS. Like mm -hmm. that's actually a big step for us, and then yeah. I think. So, and my Inspire project is to look at what positions the U.S. could actually take within the NGFS agenda. Um, I don't think it's obvious that 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 the U.S. necessarily adopts the particular scenarios that are embedded in that. Um, we might have to develop our own scenarios, particularly because we don't know what our policy is going to be. I mean, right now we have eight different carbon tax bills that have been introduced in this Congress, they have different price trajectories, they have different um, uses of the revenue, that all sorts of differences, and that's just within the carbon pricing policies, never mind the clean electricity standards and all the other dogs and cats that have been proposed either legislatively or in principles within the Democratic Party. So we don't know what all that stuff's gonna be. So when we think about what makes it for a sensible, certainly a transition scenario, in the United States, we're going to want to span that that range of policy uncertainty and make sure we have scenarios that um, reflect the policy uncertainty as well as all these other um, factors that can go into the impacts of the transition. Great, thanks, Adele. So, uh, 
Chris, I mean, this 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 point of market neutrality, obviously, a sort of a founding stone of sort of central bank practice for for for, for many years. And your reflection on 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 on, on how that how we re sort of re look at that core principle in the context of dealing with climate risk and so on, sort of how we need to uh, update it, change it, uh, adjust it, or, or or leave it as it is. Or what's your sort of views there? Thanks. Well, I, just to just to reiterate the the point that um, Adele made, I I, I think. You know, parallel to this, we need to make sure that the markets are reflecting risk as quickly as possible. And and there's, um, I could talk for hours about this, but there's 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 a whole load of things that we can do to make that work. One is increased level of disclosure, and the the UK government is working uh, uh, on a on a on a project to determine whether mandatory disclosure should be brought in and over what timeline. The, the, the second one is making firms understand climate risk. And one of the ways to do that is to do scenario analysis and to understand what these risks look like, because data from the past is not a good indicator of risks in the future in the, in the, in the climate world. And that's one of the things that we are really, really pushing on. And another, an, another area um, which we've looked at and which the, uh, the COP unit, so the, the, uh, the, the cross-governmental team that's been drawn together to uh, lead our um, efforts towards COP26 is to look at you know what are the metrics that we can use to understand climate risk better. Uh, for example, um, how do you develop a portfolio warming metric that is comparable and allows you to see uh, where climate risk I I exists? So, so I think that has to be a key focus of ours. But that is not going to happen overnight. That's going to take a while to um, in, embed. So um, in, in terms of market new, neutrality, I, I think this is exactly the right question uh, for us to be asking ourselves. And as I mentioned, Andrew Bailey has said that this is something that we, we should all be exploring. And, um, and he said that he, wanted, he wants the bank to, to explore it. I think it does throw up some really, really interesting questions um, that need to be worked, worked through. Um, for, for example, I mean, there, there will be a distributional impact of um, uh, going away from market neutrality, and that's something we need to understand. Um, right. Also, if you're, if you're going to be um, picking certain stocks over others, what is the basis that you're doing that on? Are you, are you doing it on today's basis, i.e. how brown is a, a firm's activity today? Or are you looking at um, how brown that activity will be in the future? Because there are some firms that are brown today, but they're looking to transition quite quickly. Um, and there's other firms that are brown and they're not looking to transition quite quickly. How do you create the right reward incentives in this? And do you have the data to do that? These are all really big questions that we need to look through. Just And, and from the Bank of England's perspective, I, I think it's, I, I, I think, um, I think we made the point that different central banks have different portfolios. So, so from, from our perspective, yeah. actually 98% of our portfolio um, is invested in gilts. Um, so 2% so is invested in corporate, corporate bonds. So, so um, the, moving away from market neutrality might not actually have that much impact on the overall Bank of England portfolio. But that's not to say that central banks don't have a broader role in, um, in providing you know, leadership to, to the market. But, 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 but when you look at other central banks, particularly in Europe, I think the, 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 uh, the impacts would be much larger. And, and I think that's why you're seeing um, some, some areas uh, pioneering analysis in this area, um, because it is such a big deal for the portfolio that they hold. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, and if I, I'm, we're going to have to bring the session to a close, but maybe one of the um, points is of this sort of fiscal monetary coordination. Uh, Adele, I think you, you you highlighted that in terms of obviously the centrality of, of, of carbon pricing, and I think signals from regulators whose job to maintain financial stability to the fiscal and, and, and the and the representative authorities that actually this is what they need. They can't function properly without it. Very very uh, important. And then I think uh, Chris, your point about sovereign bonds, uh, really really important. Um, and, and, and clearly, as we go to aligning uh, the financial system with, let's say, the net zero target, we're going to need to have sovereign bonds aligned with two degrees or less. Some sovereign bonds are, are near to five degrees uh, temperature warming. And I think I know your portfolio is about 3.5 degrees temperature uh, warming, I think. So, so I think actually that, that sort of, again, signals from the, the central bank based on your portfolio and your analysis back to the, the guys who actually issue the sovereign bonds to ensure that they are 
uh, aligned, I think is, uh, is, is, is really important. Thanks uh, to all of you for joining. Um, I think we're going to have to close. I can see someone in the questions had referenced a paper by Hugh uh, Chenet on precautionary principles. That was a, 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 a original analysis that actually came through the Inspire program uh, as, as well. And I think we're on the hour. So I'd like to thank you for joining. I'd like to thank uh, Simon and Nuli for presenting. There'll be another edition of the toolbox coming to uh, an email chain near you. And thanks to you, Chris, uh, for your insights. And Adele, uh, thanks for joining. And also congratulations to the report. And please get some rest. Um, so thanks, everyone. And uh, we're, we're done. Thanks so much. Thank you.